Malik Murphy, one of the top quarterbacks in the transfer portal, has announced that he's 106% committed to the Duke Blue Devils. What does that mean for Manny Diaz and staff? We talk about that on today's episode of Locked On Blue Devils. Hi, everybody. Dick Vitale. Hey, make sure you listen, man, to Locked On Blue Devils with J.J. Jackson. He's awesome, baby. You are Locked On Blue Devils, your daily podcast on the Duke Blue Devils. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of the Locked On Blue Devils podcast. My name is JJ Jackson. It's so great to have you here with us. On this Friday, December 29th, 2023, Lockdown Blue Devils is your one-stop shop for everything going on in the life of Duke Athletics. We're excited to talk about this Duke football program once again today. Duke basketball back in action tomorrow when they take on Queens. But it's a new quarterback for Duke coming into the new year. Malik Murphy from Texas has announced that he is 106% committed to the Duke Blue Devil program. Six, the jersey number that he wore at Texas last season. So we'll talk about that with our good pal Josh Cox, who's back with us once again. And then let's have some fun. Since 2010, who are those top five Duke football quarterbacks? We'll kind of put that into our conversation during today's show. And can Malik Murphy potentially be one of those guys for the Duke program? So without further ado, let's bring him on in. My good pal Josh Cox, who joins us here. And uh, we said it yesterday, Josh, the season is over for 2023. And now you got to start building your roster for next year. Yeah, I mean, it, it starts quickly, right? I mean, that was the focus uh, throughout all the offseason. Obviously, with the coaching change, your roster really, there's more question marks on your roster than, you know, if there was no co- coaching change, certainly. And so, uh, yeah, all eyes, as soon as the uh, Monday morning uh, news came that Mike Elko was headed to College Station, uh, immediately, you know, Duke fans, especially some of the paranoid Duke fans, you know, immediately we're going to have a mass exodus. How are we going to fill the team next year? You know, the, all the doomsday stuff comes, but some of those are valid. You know, who who would who will stick around? Who's going to be on the team next year? And obviously as Nina King, you know, narrowed her search down and focused in on Manny Diaz, certainly that's priority number one right now is getting that locker room ready. So with that, a quarterback is a big question that every football team has. And Duke, of course, had three different quarterbacks start a game for them in 2023. Typically, I say that to one anybody when you're talking about football and you think that the results are the reason why you started so many quarterbacks, right? That you were losing games, poor yeah. performance, too many turnovers, interceptions thrown. Not the case for Duke football. Quarterbacks were just kind of going through injuries between Riley Leonard and then Henry Blue in the fourth, and then the true freshman Grayson Loftus kind of ended the season. So with the new coaching staff comes in, they assess the quarterback room. You can never really have enough, as we learned this year, Josh, right? Oh, for sure. And, and I mean, the first thing that happened was uh, you had Tyler Cherry decommit, as we mentioned on the, on the show uh, previously. Tyler Cherry decommits. And so now with Riley Leonard moving on to Notre Dame, you're, you're, you got a two-quarterback room. Um, and so you, you can't you can't function that way um, in 2023, as you, as we noticed. I mean, as you mentioned, we we won ACC games this year with three different quarterbacks, and so that room has got to be at least three deep. There were seasons at Duke where that room was four deep uh, of guys that could actually go out there and you know at least manage a football game. And so I believe it was a no brainer for Duke to get into the portal. Now we're about to get into it. Um, you know, they, they could have gone into the portal looking for like a third string, you know, uh, role filler, you know, but they went they went for it. Uh, yeah. Coach Diaz went for it and landed it. And so uh, definitely got a guy who, you know, will probably come in as, uh, you know, as the, the favorite, at least to be QB one, not to say there's not going to be uh, some good competition. competition. In that yeah. Yeah. Who is Malik Murphy? People might not be aware yeah. of this guy. Who is he? Well, he's a big old boy. Number one, he is uh, he is six foot five and two hundred thirty eight pounds. Uh, so, if I said Duke got a guy in who's six five two thirty five, you'd say, "Oh, is he playing defensive end?" Yeah. Quarterback you know? would not be the position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so uh, he's a he's a big guy. Um, when he was recruited um, out of the state of Texas, I mean, he was a top ten uh, uh, dual threat, you know, type type recruit. 
Um, let's see. I'm, I'm trying to get the actual numbers. Number nine QB in the 2022 uh, class. And so um, he was the number four QB in the portal. Just think, think that through. He was the fourth best QB in the portal. Um, this is a guy who went to Texas. And this is all I'll say about him. He went to Texas and he beat out Arch Manning uh, for that second spot in the quarterback room. And I don't, I'm not there at practices. I don't know much about the Texas uh, you know, system and, and all their culture there. But I think for a guy to come in whose last name is not Manning <laughs> and to be QB2 and put Arch Manning as QB3, that's got to say something about what the coaching staff there at Texas saw you know, in, uh, in Malik Murphy. And then he got his, he's got a shot this year, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, and then, and, and, and played up to par and, and got two victories as a redshirt freshman. You know, we talk about different quarterback styles and with that can come size. And so I'm glad you brought that up because yeah, when you look at Malik Murphy, that's one of the very first things that you evaluate with the guy that jumps off the page, so to speak that and the unique spelling of his first name, in Malik with two A's. I haven't really seen that before, but I love it. Uh, but it, that's that frame that you mentioned, 6'5", 238. Very familiar for folks in this state uh, with a quarterback that we saw professionally lead the Carolina Panthers to a Super Bowl and the MVP award. Uh, and I'm talking about Cam Newton, of course, who played his college ball at cool. Auburn at 6'5", 245. So uh, it, kind of unique to see a quarterback that big out there on the football field, but it kind of adds a different style, a different playing card, so to speak, when you're putting the quarterback room together as a whole. Well, I, just to, just to put it in perspective, I feel like Henry Bielen is a big dude. Like, yeah, I feel like Henry Bielen is like built, ripped to your He's everyday six, guy. Big dude. Correct. Yeah. He is six three two ten. Yeah. Malik Murphy is six five two thirty eight, and so <laughs> that puts it in a little bit of perspective. If you've ever stood beside Henry. Uh, with or without pads on, you know how big of a dude he is. And so to be able to put a guy back there who, you know, he has a, he has a solid, strong arm. I mean, it, it, his throws look effortless. Like he's not even he's not even exerting energy in throwing the long ball. Um, and so you see a guy like that who then obviously on a short yardage, you know, third or fourth down is going to be able to – he's going to fall forward, right, J.J.? He's going to – He's going to fall forward for two yards. You're not going to be able to push this guy back at 6'5", 238. And so, yeah, I mean, there's uh, – interesting, I know you being uh, kind of down there in that area, you know, the, the Cam Newton thing makes perfect sense. The uh, the Vince Young, uh, you yeah. know, type type thing. Uh, the Tim Tebow with an arm, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, type type scenario. Uh, and obviously those, those three are like incredible Heisman Trophy type, uh, you know, national championship type quarterbacks. But he's got the build. He's got the makeup um, of that. And so something Duke has never seen in, in that quarterback room. But now we're excited that we get to see it, right? That this guy 100%. has decided he wants to play for Duke. He is 106, 106 committed to the program. That's pretty yeah. awesome, man. Yeah, he is. And I'm, you know, I'm sure as he gets to Durham, he's going to immediately turn into a fan favorite. Uh, looking forward to, you know, me personally, looking forward to seeing him in spring practice. Uh, just to see, you know, how he looks out there and just the difference in size uh, between him and everyone else. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you do have these guys that are transferring in, and, and and Duke right now is in a little bit of a leadership void. You know, obviously you had strong leadership in Riley Leonard and Jamie on Franklin and, and Jalen Calhoun and, of course, Dwayne Carter, and you could go on down the list, Cam Dillon. You had very good leaders, Graham Barton, uh, Jacob Monk. Uh, so there's a big leadership void, I feel like, this year, and I know there's going to be some guys – who step up that are currently on the roster, guys like Trey Freeman, guys like Wes Williams, guys like Chandler Rivers. But I also see this as an opportunity for a guy like Malik Murphy to come in and, and really win this team over with his leadership, uh, not just his play, but his off-the-field leadership, and really make this his team. To let people know, Texas is one of the four teams playing in the college football playoff that we will see to start the new year. The reason that they're eligible for that conversation is that they continue to win football games, and Malik Murphy helped them do that this season. How so? We'll dive into that a little bit more specifically after we take our first time out here on today's episode of Locked on Blue Devils. Lockdown Blue Devils here today is brought to you by our friends over at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. 
from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with the eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available to U.S. customers. All right, let's move forward. We bring back in Josh Cox from Duke Football Talk Section 17 Podcast. Going to get to our top five Duke quarterbacks since 2010 in just a moment, but want to talk a little bit more about Malik Murphy, the newest quarterback uh, that has committed to Duke. So you mentioned playing for Texas this past season. Quinn Ewers was QB1 until he got hurt, and then we saw a few games with Malik Murphy as their starting quarterback, beating out Arch Manning, as you pointed to earlier. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the most you know impressive win I would say would be the Kansas State win. Uh, this is a team ranked in the top twenty-five. Just won their bowl game uh, earlier this week against yep. uh, NC State. You know, State. <laughs> uh, but uh, but anyway, uh, but a good solid team there. And, and obviously, whenever you're at that level that that Texas played at this season, and your quarterback goes down, I mean, it's one of those things where like our season is legitimately in the balance here. And so I would say that. You can't just look at his numbers, which I I believe he threw the ball well, three touchdowns. I know he had three picks as well. But you have to look at this. It's not just the numbers and the play on the field. It's the pressure that that young man was under as a redshirt freshman. Uh, You know, without them saying it, it's basically like, hey, man, if we have a shot to win the national title, you're going to have to play well, and you're going to have to win this football game or these two football games uh, for us. And so I I love the fact that he was able to take that under pressure um, and then take the keys to the – you know, to to the car for two games and come out with two victories. And so, you know, I'm I'm a big I'm a big guy on that. At the end of the day, I want guys to have great stats, and great stats are awesome. We'll talk about some great stats here in a minute with some top five Duke quarterbacks for some great stats. But the best stat is the win column. You can throw for 500 yards, and if you have a one in that L column. That's not, that's not as impressive to me. It doesn't mean as much. Yeah, no, you're exactly right on that. I mean, it, when you're able to put the wins on your team's kind of record at the end of the year, that's what we're going to remember. And as we po- talk about great Duke football quarterbacks, many times we are going to talk a little bit about the wins that they were able to do in addition to those stats. So nearly 500 yards on the season for Malik Murphy, three touchdowns, three interceptions. But again, to keep his team in the college football playoff hunt, to keep it alive, Uh, And I think another big thing going into this upcoming season for Duke, yes, there's going to be a competition. We believe this will be QB1 at the end of the day. There's something to be said for knowing you're the guy and having the offense really tailored around you for what you're able to do. Yeah, certainly. I mean, he's a different quarterback than yours was. And so he stepped in and kind of filled that role. But at Duke, similar to what, you know, Auburn did with Cam Newton, similar to what the Panthers did with Cam Newton for many years is you literally tailor make your offense around a guy like that. And so you're right. If he is, if he comes in and quickly establishes establishes himself as the number one guy, then I believe it's Manny Diaz and, and Jonathan Brewer and the rest of the offensive staff's job to figure out, okay, how do we create the system around this guy and, and go from there? I'm going to have you kind of be the talent evaluator for this uh, Duke football team, right? Kind of Derek Miller's position over the last All few right. seasons, the, the new general manager, so to speak. So – a lot left to be done for Duke uh, when you look at 2024's roster and their conversation still to be had. There's transfer portal guys out there. But if you're Malik Murphy and you're looking at those skill guys, you're looking at playmakers to give the ball to, what are you seeing in 2024? Who are you seeing yeah. in 2024? Well, first of all, for Duke, you're seeing a great uh, running back core uh, coming back with Jock Lesmore, you know, pulling himself back out of the uh, transfer portal and, and kind of recommitting himself to Duke. You have him, you have Peyton Jones, you have Marquise Collins, you have Travis Bates, you have a really good running back room. Um, I think you have pieces of a really good offensive line, and I think you have I think you have the commitment of this coaching staff to going into the portal to bolster that line. So you may not know the names of your linemen yet, but I believe that Manny Diaz is focused very heavily 
on those O linemen. And so I think you know you're going to have that. And then, listen, I can't speak for the freshmen coming up. I know Sean Brown is 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 in the mix. Uh, I know a guy like Makai Wall is in the mix. But listen, Jordan Moore is a uh, incredible, incredible receiver. Let's forget. Like, let's just put it out of our minds that he played quarterback. Yeah. He's just a great receiver. Right. His numbers stood up this year. He led the team in every statistical category as a receiver. He's doing nothing but getting stronger, bigger, and faster. He will be, obviously, he and Riley Leonard had a great connection. He and Grayson Loftus had a great connection. So Jomo seems to be that guy. He'll work well with the quarterback. He understands the position. Obviously, the Malik Murphy is in. And so I believe if if you're coming to Duke and you see that, you're like, okay, like I've got I've got a wide receiver who may not be six four, you know, he may not be DK Metcalf, right? He may not look like that, but if I throw the ball anywhere near him, he's he's got he's got the, his hands on the ball, and so I think that's good for him. I do think there's going to be some portal looks there, even a wide receiver. Um, looks like Duke is in the running for the kid out of Miami of Ohio, uh, who's one of the top uh, three or four wideouts in the portal right now. Um, you know, I. I I think it'll be interesting to see guys like Chase Tyler, who is coming in as a true freshman, but he is 6'3", 6'4". He is that big prototype receiver. you got guys who came in last year, and Apollos Cook, who's a tall guy, uh, Spencer Jones, who's a tall guy. So I do think that'll be interesting, but I would not be shocked if if Diaz does not dip into the portal at the wide receiver position to give him one more. And I, and I mentioned all that and forgot Samir Higgins. I'm not forgetting yeah. him. Samir Higgins is, is a starter, solidified – loves this program and is a great receiver. All right, so I want to get to our top five quarterbacks here in just a yep. moment, but I do want to kind of frame this in, in the Malik Murphy perspective. He's going to have some time to come and play football for Duke University, put together some pretty good numbers and be remembered as one of the greats. What is that going to take? Kind of what are your just overall big picture thoughts as to how we potentially could remember Malik Murphy? Big I mean, question. Really, have never seen him put on the uniform officially before, but we got to have some question. fun here. I think it really depends on how much they're willing to tailor make the offense around him. I really do. I feel like if you if you try to put a, a, a square peg in a round hole, this isn't going to work. I think if you're going to commit, if he's going to be your guy, then you've got to build that offense around him. And no matter if it looks the way everybody thinks it ought to look, you just got to do what's right for him. And so I think that's going to be the big key is, is, you know, will Duke be able to do that? And then, you know, as every year, JJ, like next year, we're going to go through this again. If he has a great year, you know, you know, everyone's coming after him. Yeah. All these teams that need that want a one year guy are going to come after him. And honestly, by next year, at the end of next year, he'll be eligible to go to the draft if he wanted to. So I think that all those things kind of factor in. It's like if he's too good this year, he's either going to go pro or he's going to go somewhere else. You know what I mean? Like it's just odd. It's a different, it's a different landscape in college football. Some of the guys we're going to talk about in this top five, you know, they were here for four years, five years. We knew it they were able to get four years worth of stats, right? And and so it's difficult to get that when you're when you're uh, competing for championships as a program. Let's win QB1 first, but then yep. quickly after that, let's push for the Heisman. Let's get him there in that conversation go. early. Start let's it. kind of pump that narrative. That'd be awesome. All right, one more break, and then let's take a look at some top five quarterbacks that we're thinking about in recent memory with this Duke football program. All right, Lockdown Blue Devils here today, brought to you by our friends at Prize Picks. Prize Picks, of course, is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. The easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings continue to roll in. Right now, go ahead and go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college and use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. I love prize picks because I've been able to test my skills this season and the most exciting way to play DFS. If you have the skills, you can easily turn $10 into 250 bucks with just a few taps. Take that for a turnaround there. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Price picks is daily fantasy sports made easy. 
Winding down today's episode of Lockdown Blue Devils, Josh Cox is here with me today. Go ahead and uh, promote the Section 17 podcast, if you will, Josh. You guys have merch available. If people want to get those presents uh, after the Christmas holiday, you guys have uh, the feed coming out on YouTube that people can watch the show, everything you guys have going on. Yeah, for sure. We uh, DukeFootballTalk.com, we have everything you need there. Uh, we release podcasts. We have a, a merch store uh, that we're going to be adding to. we got some creative ideas uh, that we, we would like to do there in the offseason as well. Um, and then, of course, our social media outlets. You know, we're, we're very active there, trying to stay active, uh, keep the fans engaged even through the offseason. Uh, our Facebook group, uh, you just search Duke Football Talk there. Uh, got some great content in there as well. Uh, but, yeah, we, we appreciate subscribers on YouTube. Uh, you know, reviews. Uh, is this coming out on Friday or Saturday? Yeah, today. Coming out today. Friday. Friday. So it's five star Friday. You know, at the end yeah. of the day, so, uh, before the end of today, we need uh, we need at least one five star review and rating on Locked On Blue Devils, and then on Section Seventeen podcast from somebody that's watching or listening. So if you haven't done that and we earned it, would you give us each a five star rating and review? I- I'm thinking about the merch right now, man, and I'm I'm a uh, oh, chief yeah. consultant right now and. It, I'm thinking about when players get traded, you instantly see the jerseys kind of go down to a significant retail price. Uh, and we're, we're, we're moving the Elko era gear from the Section 17 yeah. show over to clearance, man. It has uh, they, <laughs> they have been removed from the site. Yeah, they've been removed from the site. That is now a retro throwback. <laughs> a retro throwback. I'm glad to be a part of that company with you, my That's friend. Right. So That's go right. check out all their awesome stuff. All right, let's get to it. Top five quarterbacks since 2010. Final segment of the show here today. So I'm going to be fun, Josh. I'm going to let people see our full list, uh, okay. and then we'll have you kind of go through your thought process. Put together here on Lockdown Blue Devils by our dear friend, uh, Josh Cox. So the top five quarterbacks since 2010. want to keep it semi-recent as we're talking yep. about new quarterbacks in this day and age of the sport. Uh, Renfrey, number one. Daniel Jones, number two. You've got Boone, Anthony Boone, number three. Riley Leonard, number four. And then Thomas Sirk, the fifth quarterback that you put there. Uh, how difficult was this to put together? And then kind of the rankings. Talk me through your thought process. Yeah, I mean, I think there were some clear cuts. And then, uh, you know, I think Renfrey's a clear cut. And everything else from there, uh, you have to start figuring out what what means the most. And, you know, those types of things, um, you know, to Duke. Uh, but if you just look at Sean Renfrey's numbers, I mean, first of all, his numbers at Duke, he did not – he's second all-time in passing yardage, okay? He trails only Thaddeus Lewis, okay? He has 9,465 yards. Thaddeus Lewis had 10,065 yards. So he is – he's right there, right? He's within he's within 1,000, less than 1,000 of Thaddeus Lewis. Here's the difference. Thaddeus Lewis played all 12 games as a true freshman and threw 2,134 yards as a freshman. <laughs> Sean Renfrey did not play but six games as a backup as a freshman behind Thaddeus Lewis, and he only threw 330 yards. So all that to say, if Sean Renfrey plays a full four seasons like Thaddeus Lewis did, he is hands down, not even close. He's the number one passer, you know, as far as yardage and all those types of things. So – um, so I'll give Sean Renfrey that nod. The Go time ahead. frame in this for people that aren't following as well. Yeah. Thaddeus Lewis doesn't really qualify as much to be there. Yes. Yeah, he left. 20, 2009 was his last season. So this is 2010. And, Pretty and, and easy after. to cut him off then. Cut him right off. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, so you have uh, you have 2010, 2011, and 2012 um, leading up to, you know, what we're going to get to in 2013 in a second. Uh, but I think if you take Sean Renfrey's numbers at Duke, and then you take the fact that he uh, had a journeyman's career in the NFL as well, played for the Falcons and some other teams uh, in the NFL, I think he's he's the number one. All right, he's number one. So um, after that, you have the number two quarterback. And uh, a sizable I, drop. Uh, I I would say so. I, this is my opinion. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I know recency bias here, people. You know, but I, I went Daniel Jones. Okay. When Daniel Jones is my number two quarterback. Now, obviously, Daniel Jones was the sixth overall pick. Um, you know, by the New York Giants, we know that. Uh, he has had an up and down um, you know, career, obviously, with the Giants. Um, had some injuries, uh, especially here recently this season, uh, after signing a big contract. A large um, payday. Yeah. yeah, you know. Um, but if you look at his numbers in three seasons, he threw over 8,200 uh, yards. 8,200 yards. Now, that does not include – um, the fact that uh, he also rushed for 486, 518, 
and 319 yards, uh, respectively, um, in, in those three seasons. And so you add another 1,300. Well. Yeah. yeah. Another 1,300 yards and another 17 touchdowns. So he threw for 52 touchdowns. Yeah, he threw for 52 and he ran for 17 in three seasons. Um, and so Daniel Jones, I mean, there are some Those incredible are numbers. Yeah. yeah, they are. They are. There's some incredible numbers there. Um, you know, oh, by the way, his his timeline, just just to remind people, 2016, 2017, 2018. And uh, as as I think my section 17 guys would remind me, uh, he played quarterback when Duke's offensive line began the downward trajectory under David Cutcliffe. And so he did not have a good offensive line at all in his three seasons there. Uh, he did not have the offensive line that Anthony Boone had, and we're going to get still got Anthony the Boone job done. Himself. Yeah, got all the right. job done. Ran the ball like crazy. UNC game, uh, incredible stat line. Bowl game, incredible stat line. So that's number two. Uh, Anthony we're going Boone to- is number three. A B A B Anthony Boone, a Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Of course, Daniel Jones is too, but another Charlotte, North Carolina guy. Um, and Anthony Boone, and Anthony Boone, obviously, he gets a little bit of the nod here because of the team that he played on. Yeah, you know, if if you look at at Anthony Boone, um, you know his his 2013 uh, season that was a special year uh, for Duke, and and he threw for 2,200 yards uh, that season. Um, he rushed uh, he rushed the ball decently as well um, that season. Another 214 yards on the ground. Once again, with this one, it's really about the W in the win column uh, that makes it for me. Um, you know, at the uh, he, he doesn't have the gaudy stats um, that some of these other guys have, but he does have he does have wins. He does have wins, and so you know, he finished his career um, in 2014, uh, that season after that 2013 uh, year, and he had another great season that year, threw for 2,700 yards, uh, 19 touchdowns, had a better year in 2014 than he had in 2013. 2,700 so yards is crazy. It is. Uh, it is. <laughs> and, and, you know, wow. right now, currently, he is one of the elite quarterback trainers. Uh, you know, the, a lot of guys go to him. A lot of uh, – so that's he's still using his abilities, you know, to help help high school kids and stuff like that. So, uh, really cool. So, Anthony Boone gets my nod uh, as, as number three. Okay, we go on to number four. We've got Riley Leonard there. Yeah, you know – this is probably a little bit of recency bias. Uh, you know, I have Thomas Sirk as the next guy um, after him, and you know, I could make I could make the argument for Thomas Sirk. Thomas Sirk's 2015 season at Duke was 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 pretty solid, but I will say this: Riley Leonard's 2022 season at Duke was extremely solid. Pretty uh, awesome. Yeah. Once again, like Daniel Jones, uh, used his feet um, as well as his legs. Uh, took this Duke team from, uh, you know, he played in one game the previous season. No one really knew what was, you know, what his talent, you know, level was. Uh, Coach Elko comes in the first season, names rather than the starting quarterback, and he takes ownership of that team. Uh, the team goes eight and four. The team wins the military bowl. Nine and four, I'm sorry. Nine and four. Team wins the military bowl. Uh, and it is, it is Riley Leonard everything, everywhere. And Duke was fortunate to even to get him back now, now thinking about it, uh, yeah. getting back for this past season, where unfortunately his season was injury riddled. Uh, just he was he never was able to really get his stride running the ball or throwing the ball. Um, but that season, this past twenty twenty two season, he's my number four overall quarterback for Duke. Big wins this past year in the twenty twenty three season before. Yeah. Uh, getting hurt and uh, yeah, being there all the way to the end in the game against Notre Dame, and now he'll go off and start his own career with the Irish. So uh, finally, Thomas Sirk, as we wrap this up, top five again: yeah. Renfrey at one, Daniel Jones at two, Anthony Boone at three, Riley Leonard is fourth. So one spot left, and Thomas Sirk is getting the nod here. Yeah, I went with Thomas Sirk, and he really had one season, uh, you know, at, at at Duke where he uh, where he played. I mean, he he played in twelve games in twenty fourteen, but he was really more of a runner. Um, uh, in, in 2014, he rushed for 238 yards and eight touchdowns in 2014. Uh, but in 2015, he kind of took over the reins of the offense. He threw for 2,600 plus yards, 16 it's touchdowns to the air. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, another eight touchdowns and 809 rushing yards on the ground. So, uh, you know, he had 24 touchdowns total in his 2015 season. That was the, he was the last quarterback, you know, really, I feel like that 2013. 14 and 15, those blocks of years for Duke were really, really high quality. 
And so Thomas Sirk gets my nod as the fifth one there. A uh, little shout out to Brandon Kinnett played with Anthony Boone. Brandon Kinnett, um, you know, rushed for 13 touchdowns um, in, in a season. I think he's still tied for the record or something like that. Uh, as a quarterback, as a backup quarterback, he rushed for 13 touchdowns. So yeah. that was a season that anytime we got anywhere near the goal line, Boone came out and and, <laughs> I, and I came out. So, yeah, those are my top five from 2010. I love it. I love it. Top five quarterbacks since 2010. And now here's the fun part, Josh. We get to let social media react to this. We want to see what people have to say down in the YouTube comments below. So uh, let us know who your top five would be. And ultimately, we hope that a guy like Malik Murphy can put his name into this conversation when we're talking about the great Duke football quarterbacks. Uh, love seeing you as always. Love having you here on the show with us, Josh. Once again, give us one more promo for all the work that you've got going on. Yeah, check us out, DukeFootballTalk.com. And on social media, you can follow me as well, at Josh McCox. I do some basketball stuff along with football stuff as well. If you're interested in basketball, I don't know if any Duke fans uh, are interested in basketball at all. Uh, no, but uh, but obviously coming up, <laughs> ACC play begins uh, after this game with Queens. And it is, uh, you know, pedal to the metal, uh, going through, trying to see if Duke can, uh, can live up to the preseason hype, right? So uh, follow me there. And we'll be releasing our uh, Section 17 uh, kind of end of the season podcast here in the next couple of days. And so that's always a fun time. You've earned one more question for me to, from me all today. Right, here we go. And, uh, all right, let's go basketball. Queens coming right. up this weekend. What's the proper way to get Tyrese Proctor settled back in, do you think? Oh, that's a that's a really good question because, yeah, you you, you have Caleb Foster who has really settled into his role. and Looking uh, more and more comfortable, yeah. Uh, yeah, 100%. And – uh, you know, I, I would say that Coach Shire first game is going to you know bring Proctor off the bench. I, I, w- I would assume, um, and you know let him kind of get his fifteen minutes um, and kind of you know see those because you know Duke is really because they're so deep. Yeah. Duke has kind of settled into this new, you know, Jalen Blake's is getting his minutes and these other guys are getting their good minutes. So now they got to figure this out again. So I, I was rotation. Yeah, I would see that, but I do think that after a game or two of that, and and nothing against Caleb Foster. But this is Tyrese Proctor's team. He's a captain. He'll be getting his full, you know, minutes, and and he won't be restricted at all, and it'll be back to what it was pre-injury. That's that's the way I think Shire's going to deal with that. Well, cheers to you, Josh. We'll see you again in uh, 2024, okay? Yeah, man. Happy New Year. All right. That's Josh Cox joining us here on today's episode of Lockdown Blue Devils, and that brings our show here to a close. Happy New Year to you and your family as well. Let's go, Duke. I'll talk to you again soon. My name is JJ Jackson. Thank you, and good day.